your family, your father in particular, but also your mother, they, and many, many Koreans in the 1990s, when things fell apart so catastrophically, there was an, the emergency re-emergence of free enterprise in some sense. It was illegal, highly illegal. Tell us what your father and your mother did to survive. So as you said, right, in the 90s, until then, so in North Korea right now, you cannot own cars, you cannot own houses, everything's private. So no private property in North Korea. You don't even own your stuff. Everything is state-owned. So therefore, trading is illegal. That is a, is a, you are committing a crime. But after the 90s, the Soviet Union collapsed, people had to find their own ways to survive outside the North Korean government. So the regime created this ideology called the Zuti ideology, self-reliance ideology. So they told the people, okay, you alive on your own. We are not going to give you public distribution. You should figure out on your thing. Then like, how do we figure out on thing? We don't have freedom. We cannot even trade. So people started getting into this thing called the black market. But all right. So simultaneously, so what was happening in North Korea simultaneously? was that the centralized government distribution system collapsed completely when it was no longer subsidized. And the North Korean government decided that everyone was now on their own while simultaneously making any ownership and any trade whatsoever illegal and punishable with extreme punishments. So you were on your own, but forbidden to do anything that would get you out of your condition of starvation and privation. Exactly. I, like you, now I'm thinking back, people said like, oh, what were you allowed to do in North Korea? I literally sat down one day, like, what was I allowed to do on my own? Literally just breathing. That is the only thing that I was allowed to do on my own. The regime literally tell you what to read, what to listen to. They even send you prison if you dance in a wrong way. If you wear jeans, they say it's a symbol of capitalism, they send you prison. If women wear like skirt, like pants, sometimes they say, oh, you got to women have to wear the skirt. And if you watch wrong movie and even the haircut, they tell you what kind of hair. It was a funny joke for the Westerners. They I cannot believe in North Korea, you have to follow the hair. America line, the guidelines. That's how controlling the is. They intervene every aspect of your life. And literally, they, when there are some times when we have even electricity, they would give us this radio that we cannot turn off. We can lower the volume, but can never turn off at home. So they force us to listen to this propaganda. Blast right. And it's stuck on one time. channel. Yeah, and, no, there's and, only one channel. And you and you can't you can't move the station selector to listen to anything else. That's illegal as well. Yes, and that's the thing, like the regime doesn't allow us anything and then but let us somehow find a way to survive. And of course, that means breaking the rules in North Korea. And my father was involved in black market. Which he started selling dry fish, sugar, rice, clothes, clocks. And then later the murders like copper, silver, copper. And of course, that was illegal. And that's how it was sent to prison camp. Right. And so he started to trade. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in your book that, that the trading aspect as far as you were concerned, that the trading activity that emerged as a consequence of the black market gave North Koreans their first small taste of freedom. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by that? Why did that strike you that way? Because it's a trading is a very empowering act because until then, North Koreans had to rely on everything from the regime, like literally even the water, everything. But when we started being creative, and they say, okay, I can find the corn, like a cheaper price in this region and then bring it to the other region and bring on maybe fabric from this region to the other region. So we start getting more control over like how we even think, how to look. And, but it was like North Korean's marketization was extremely controlled and still very limited, but that was almost just giving the people now to think, oh, there is a life when I take my own control of my life. It's better than relying on government who just promise to take care of everything, but who never does. So now the younger generation has tasted marketization and thirst for more freedom to being in the market system. So your conclusion was that there was a direct connection between the, the act of engaging in in free trade, say, mm -hmm. at the personal level and the idea of freedom itself. It forces you to think for yourself when you trade. 
when you trade, it's not like you are thinking about, oh, how am I gonna like become a better revolutionary for the region? You think for yourself, like how is it gonna benefit me, my family, if I do this? But for North Koreans, thinking for yourself was something so unheard of. Like when we are born, the first thing they teach us how to bow properly and respect. And the first thing that my mom told me as a young girl was not to even whisper because the birds and mice could hear me. She told me that, the most dangerous thing in my body that I had was my tongue. If you slip a wrong word, that is end of our like entire family clan. That's how much dangerous your tongue is. Yes, so you carefully discuss your experiences with free trade and attribute to that the dawning idea of autonomy and, and individual freedom, whereas the act of trade is deemed illegal and immoral by the totalitarians, and that's associated in some manner with their insistence that private property is theft and that capitalism by its nature, which would include any free trade of any sort, is also corrupt and malevolent. All right, so your mother, you talked about the restrictions on your speech, that even the mice had ears, so to speak. Your mother was almost thrown into prison camp because of comments that an uncle of yours made. I believe he was visiting from China. Mm -hmm. And he, so can you tell that story? So when I was really young, we had some relatives from China. He came and told my mom and Kim Il sung the first king died. And that he said that he didn't die from hard working for the people. Because when the Kims died, they told us that, you know, like literally they tell us and people, Kims are starving like all all of us they cannot even sleep they work tirelessly for us the how grateful we are for having a leader who's that selfless but I told my mom actually he didn't die from like those exhaustion from hard working rather he died from some heart attack caused by medical condition and then my mom was a true believer still she was telling her friend best friend that can you believe how foreign like people are saying like this ridiculous rumors about our dear leader and she was more like telling out of anger that she heard it was my she was questioning it but even that was so in North Korea right now like you and me and there's one person three of us sitting here I'm watching you and you're watching the other person and that person watching me so even though I'm being a nice person not gonna report on you I know that someone watching me gonna report on me but if that person is not reporting on me then he's gonna be also reporting by the other person so you're being spied and you're just spied on some that kind of system made us to not trust in another human it carried our like trust in another person like we are always paranoid so that's a good lesson for my mom to learn even she thought all her life that was her best friend she was a spy and she told officials and my mom almost like risked killing all of us but the, the thing is because she never slipped the word to another person and she said in the from the intention of defending the revolution they like pardoned her and told her never ever say something like that ever to anybody so even my father never knew what was happening there right so even though she thought the rumor was a lie mm -hmm. and when she talked about it she was outraged that was still enough for a firm and a full investigation with a tremendous amount of danger associated and it was luck in in large part mm -hmm. that she escaped from more severe punishment and the definitely. fact maybe that she had small children definitely like right in north korea like when you have a newspaper every front page has to be Kim's. But when you turn in the back of the newspaper, you don't see the photo of Kim's. By mistake, if you rip that newspaper, your family goes three generations with a concentration camp. So if even, you rip it. Oh yeah. So it's, it's like in the, if you get a newspaper, you gotta be very careful how the photo is gonna be positioned. So every household in North Korea have them portraits of Kim's. If your house caught on fire, the first thing is not you holding your child in one arm. You have to hold the portraits till your that otherwise it's gonna kill the regions of your family again so this is like the kings are gods to us they can they are almighty that who can read our thoughts i literally believe that it was like so north korea copied the bible and it's exactly the bible kim your son was a god loved us so much gave his son to us jesus christ right kim jong -un. his body dies but his spirit is with us forever and ever therefore he knows how many here i have what i think what my future will be so if we sacrifice ourselves right now for the revolution we are gonna join him in the paradise after all. 